Alright, let's get started. So, thank you for coming out tonight. This is uh, this is uh, the, the panel that we have organized, uh, partly inspired by the Kim Sang Moon exhibit that's been going on at KRC. So, uh, for those of you who have walked in through the main entrance, you'll see the uh, the, the video panels that have been installed on the wall, and uh, the the purpose of this 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 discussion today is to kind of tap into both the historical context for that kind of art installation and then connect that to the present to sort of look at how we stand now as a community, uh, especially in the uh, era of Trump and the, the various challenges that that presents. The format for this discussion is it's going to be pretty organic, and by that it's kind of like, you know, we'll kind of see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the idea here is that, you know, rather than just having a bunch of folks up here telling us, you know, what's what, it'd be always good to hear, you know, comments from the audience, or if you guys have uh, questions, uh, that's actually the better way to facilitate a dialogue. So uh, we will have times where people can ask questions. If there's really something you really want to respond to, I, I encourage you to just you know, speak up. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, to briefly introduce myself, my name is David K. Song. I'm the, I'm the board chair of the Korean Resource Center. So uh, thank you. Uh, former staffer, a uh, long time volunteer, and uh, I've been on the board for the last few years now. Uh, as part of uh, my own experience with KRC and our connection to, this, to connect it with this exhibit, I wanted to sort of speak a little bit about how I kind of see the ties with this uh, video installation up in the main lobby and the panelists that we have gathered here today. Uh, if you think about the question of political activism, which is, I think, going to be the central focus for today's discussion, there's always been, especially for uh, Asian American communities, this question of, uh, you know, how politically active is this community? And I felt like watching, especially some of the clips of the Kim Sang Don exhibit, that it provides a little bit of uh, both background for the communities and how they have come to the United States, as well as shedding a little bit of light into how we can move forward. And by that I want to say that, you know, I, I feel like there's this idea that, first of all, uh, Asian Americans as a whole, folks have said that they're politically passive. Um, you know, why is, that, why is that the case? On one hand, I know that there are oftentimes this view that you have this group of immigrants who have come to this country, and then once they're here, the focus is on, of course, socioeconomic livelihood. <coughs> And no one really wants to walk and look. Uh, and then, you know, people have also gone on a little bit further, and I've heard various iterations of this, especially since, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an educator, I'm in the classroom, we talk about these issues in my class, and students often say, you know, people just don't really care about this stuff anymore. Uh, Asians just are either culturally passive, or they just don't care, they just want to make money, etc. And, you know, for me, especially as a, a historian, that doesn't really mean really true. I mean, if anything, you look at the history of, uh, of East Asia, or Southeast Asia, in the last uh, 100, 200 years, there's a lot of stuff going down, down there that is not about passivity. You have people who are fighting wars. There are radical restructuring of society. If you think about even Kim sang dons experience, he himself, as a political activist, has to flee South Korea because of authoritarian oppression. And that doesn't come out of just because you're going along with the program. These people have been there, and, and they've been fighting. And that's, for whatever reason, just, that seems to be this kind of story that doesn't get told. Right? It's like there's, uh, I, I, I won't necessarily say it's amnesia, because sometimes it feels like people just didn't even know that in the first place. But it's all there for the telling. Uh, if you think about in connection with the Asian American experience, and this is where I would say, uh, especially for me speaking as a second generation, um, you know, growing up in the, in the 80s and 90s as a uh, youth, um, I kind of sort of saw that, you know, there wasn't too much knowledge for me growing up about, about Asian American activism. 
And I remember one of the discussions that I actually had in grad school when I went to UCLA for the Asian American Studies um, Master's Program. Uh, we were sitting in class, and this is also a bunch of other folks who had all, you know, second, third generation Asian Americans. Some of us had community background experiences. And we were talking about uh, Asian American history and the Civil Rights Movement. And some of the people were saying stuff like, you know, yeah, we don't really, maybe the community just in general hasn't been active because we don't know any of these kinds of famous uh, icons or individuals. And part of the fact that, uh, part of that, the problem is, of course, is that those individuals who exist, just we haven't really talked too much about them. Uh, I would say in the last few years, there's been a lot more visibility around some of these historic figures, people like uh, Yuri Kochiyama, for those of you who may be aware, she uh, actually had a Google Doodle dedicated to her, I think like maybe 2015. Yuri Kochiyama herself was a Japanese American. Uh, she had gone through the incarceration experience of World War II, and her and her husband after the war would be living in the housing projects in Harlem. They'll be working alongside uh, a black activist, Puerto Rican activist. She'd be friends with Malcolm X. And going on in her life, she'll be addressing all these issues of uh, uh, racism, uh, social justice, uh, redress for Japanese Americans. You know, just a few years ago, also, there was a, great, there was a documentary uh, on Grace Lee Boggs, who was a Chinese American uh, political activist out in Detroit. She didn't really spend too much time specifically addressing Asian American issues, but as the daughter of Chinese immigrants and as a person of color, uh, she was working alongside her husband as a, a, a auto worker organizer, and they will be talking about issues of, of course, black power, especially through the civil rights movement going forward. And you know, I always thought that that was, especially if you guys have ever watched the documentary, which I highly recommend you check out. There's actually a, a, a really powerful quote that got to me when I first watched this. And she talks about how one of the problems coming out of the uh, sort of uh, experience of oppression is that you develop this view, and this is again a poor rewording of what she says, uh, there's this kind of view that you have to have this m messiah that lifts you out of oppression. And first she says, you know, that's in, the, in ways that's kind of not what we should be thinking about. Because if anything, the people themselves are the leaders. You know, why wait for someone else uh, to lead you to this, this promised land or to salvation or whatever when each person, uh, his or her own self, has that agency. You can develop that consciousness yourself, you can empower it, you can go out there, and you can make a difference. And going forward, of course, I would say, you know, we should look to ourselves. We, uh, you know, we could think about our own uh, roles and responsibilities as, as people living in a community to work towards uh, certain ends together. And also, uh, if you, if people do want to have the historical models to look look out for, there there have been a number of those folks. I mean, in Kochiyama Boggs, just one example or two examples. Uh, you think about uh, any famous labor leaders, you know, before even United Farm Workers and Cesar Chavez, that would have been possible without uh, folks like uh, Larry Itliang and Philip Veracruz, who were Filipino Manongs, that had been organizing in the Central Valley. And they're the ones who helped to provide impetus to create the United Farmers. And there's a whole number of other figures who would never become these uh, uh, people who get the same sort of publicity as Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X, but there are folks who have been fighting alongside uh, you know, Supreme Court battles to fight against segregation or to fight for uh, protections under the 14th Amendment. So these are all things that I feel like we can always draw from. And it does, again, uh, for me, it kind of counters a narrative that uh, you know Asian Americans uh, as a whole just they don't do much. They do, they do, they have, right? And if anything going forward, uh, I, I feel like that should be something to also aspire to. Now, uh, if I can introduce uh, some of the panelists, yeah. what we'll do is uh, I'll go through and introduce all the panelists. We'll start off with a few general questions um, for the panel as a whole. Uh, we can have dialogue as we go from there, and then uh, I also have some questions that we can. We can use to talk individually with each, uh, each speaker. So uh, to my left, this is uh, Chung Woo Kim. He joined the uh, Korean Resource Center as his membership development manager in 2016. Uh, he had been working in sales for over 15 years, and this is his first time in the nonprofit sector. And he's been uh, working around mobilizing uh, for DACA and immigrant youth. For the last uh, three weeks of April, he was a writer on the uh, Caravan Against Fear, uh, traveling from California to Texas to advocate for immigrant rights, resist Trump, and build momentum for the May Day strike. 
and uh, Chungu will speak about his experiences on the caravan. Uh, the next speaker is Jenny Chang uh, of Healthy California. Jenny is the regional coordinator uh, for Los Angeles, and she has been advocating for a single care healthcare system, especially around SB 562. And our final speaker is Du Choi. He is the creator of the Kim Sang Dong Project. He graduated from the California Institute of the Arts in 2011 with an undergrad degree, uh, spent time in Switzerland for his graduate studies. Along with the uh, Kim Sang Dong Project, he works, uh, continues to work on murals, large format paper and canvases that address cartography in abstract form, and his research-based and conceptual practices span from installations, performances, and film relating to the human experience toward border politics. So, uh, can I get a round of applause for our speakers? And as we were, since we started the, uh, the panel with the overview talking a little bit about these, uh, some of the political leaders that we can look towards, I just wanted to start off with a broad question that uh, each person could just share, uh, are there any leaders who inspired you to do the work that, that you've done so far? Hello guys, um, I'm start. I think, I can't say DJ, because I never, um, I've been at, I've been at, I've worked, I mean, never work at <coughs> Deju. You know, he, he really inspired me to be part of this. You uh, liar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> since, since when I was in college, um, I've been, I've been, I can't say work as an activist, but non paid, because uh, I'm a, I'm a, docu a documented and documented, so I uh, kind of advocate the dream egg on that. But I never thought of working at a, um, a non-profit, but I met him in person, and he really, yeah, he, he touched my heart, and, and it's worth the fight right now, so uh, more than ever, so um, that's why I joined. Yeah. Actually, if uh, everyone could also talk a little bit more about themselves, I know the, the biography didn't just didn't capture the full breadth of yeah, who you are as a person, so. Yeah. Yeah. The totality of your being. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm you know, I don't have hair now. <laughs> I'm shaved. <laughs> and well, um, like I said, um, I don't know. Do, do you guys want to know about me? <laughs> Sorry, I ruined your flow. Like, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Um, if you could think talk about even how you, why you transition from the to... Well, um, okay, this is, here's the thing, I can, I can tell you really honestly. Um, I was in document 18 years, so uh, since when I was 15, I was undocumented, and then, back then, no DACA, nothing, nothing, just, uh, everything was really difficult, um, so I really wanted to make money, so, uh, but, being undocumented makes a lot of money it's really difficult because you gotta bring it, you know, under, you gotta get paid under the table. And since 2012, DAC, uh, DACA <coughs> introduced, it's like, this is my chance. Uh, like now I can work legally, so uh, I try to apply for sales, any sales, um, big company. So I got um, hired by a huge financial institution um, company. Um, so I became a sales agent. Um, I try to. I mean, they said if you meet ten people per day, um, you could be a, you could be a successful. I say uh, I asked them what's what's the definition of being successful. They said you can make six figure income. Um, okay, I want to do that. I want to do that uh, because uh, I never earn more than two thousand dollars, even if I work like eighty hours. So I always get a pay in pay underpaid. But I couldn't say anything. I'd never get promoted um, because they always say, "Oh, you don't have a degree, you don't have a degree on that." So, okay. And, and now I have a DACA. It's okay. Let's do it. And, and and yeah. So I made quite good money in two years. I got promoted. And what what boom boom boom. And and, and I moved to a really big house, great car. And I feel really empty, you know, I heard. 
um, I don't know, um, I got even promoted to the position that I never thought of I could handle, but, and, and, and even having all the money and whatnot that I really dream of, because I made more money than ever in just six months and last 15 years of my working. <laughs> Uh, uh, um, yeah, so uh, I thought I would really be happy, but no, it was the exact opposite, kind of really empty, but so I, I told my boss I'm going to quit, and I took my bike, and I crossed the country, uh, my bike solo, so I rode from D.C. to Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, um, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah and California. So it took me two months. Um, I slept on the wherever I stopped. Uh, one third of my trip, I slept on the motel one third, someone's house, backyard, front yard, <laughs> highway, you name it, on church, school, wherever. And one third, I slept at the campsite. And, and, and I thought a lot. And after, after the trip, I met to DJ, and then he said, and, okay, you, there's a position that really be my interest in called organizer. Have you thought about it? I never, I don't know what it is, but he said, why don't you try it? So, um, yeah, since then I worked as an organizer and, and um, yeah, I feel different than, than um, being on a, being on just, I can say, sending a product. Um, so, yeah. Personal story. Uh, I actually am a really private person. It took me a long time to start telling my personal story. And when you're an organizer and you're, you know, working on social justice issues, you you try to activate people to tell their own personal story. And, you know, you don't want to be hypocrite. You got to tell yours too. Um, and it became easier over time when you realize your story is not that different from everyone else's. Uh, so when people ask me what drives me. Um, one person comes to mind, that's my mother. Like many of you, the story of immigrants. Um, so when I was 10, I had appendicitis. Normal enough, it's this thing in your body that's pretty useless, and it ruptured. And um, the hospital bills were astronomical because it caused a lot of infections. And we had good insurance, which covered 80% and then the 20% was up to my parents to cover. <coughs> there was a $30,000 cap, so 20% up to $30,000 they had to cover, so. $30,000 for me, and that same year my dad got a stroke, and he became debilitated, and his hospital bills were crazy, because uh, insurance didn't cover the therapy, the physical therapy, so his left side like, to this day, paralyzed. Um, so he, being disabled, all of this fell on my mom uh, to work. And I've got an autistic brother. <laughs> so my mom being who she is, a lot of people, they suffer medical bankruptcy. It's very normal in this country for people to go bankrupt. Um, but my mom being who she is, like refused to go bankrupt, that's like this horrible thing to her. She took out third party financing to cover all the medical bills. She worked all the time. I used to cry telling this story. I'm gonna try not to. Um, she just worked so hard, and I don't think it was easy for her to enjoy life. And as I grew older, you know, I saw how hard she worked. And she refused to, like, give us anything, me and my sister, a normal life. Um, she's like, you have to go to college. The whole shebang, you know? Asian, Asian parents. And it took her t over 20 years to pay down her medical bills. And when I think about that now, especially while I'm working on this, it makes me really, really angry. <laughs> because... <laughs> Pharma CEOs, insurance CEOs make so much money. And it's not because <laughs> healthcare really costs that much. It's because they can. They can charge that much. Because their life is on the line, their kids' futures are on the line. They know they can do that, and they will. And this country is very, very wealthy, one of the wealthiest countries. And we try to get charged the most for healthcare. And it's not just by a little bit, it's like over double. 
And that's why this issue is important to you. I mean, uh, I definitely have the same stories. Uh, you know, I have told uh, you guys uh, my mother had cancer for 19 years, my dad had a stroke. Uh, luckily, they were under the insurance. Uh, but uh, we also lost our house to the financial crisis. And my dad built our house. And, uh, but uh, I think my, my story comes because I don't have too much family, and I wanted to search. Uh, kind of my past history or try to understand why I, I was such a rebel and did a lot of resistance things and did graffiti and, and a lot of uh, interesting subcultures. And um, I, uh, you know, I, I traveled uh, after the financial crisis my mom got better. I, I needed to find my own self and I went to Mongolia, lived in the ex-Soviet Russian factory as an artist. I was in many other artist compounds. I, uh, I was traveling until five years ago. I recently got back uh, last year, but during that travel, I found this project because um, my grandma, she passed away, she had Alzheimer's. Uh, she was trying to tell me a story, but she couldn't even remember. And then I went to go see a distant relative who actually just passed away yesterday. And the, she's actually the one that uh, showed me this photo of my grandma and Kim Sung Gun in her wedding photo which is in the installation that speaks about that. And, um, you know, if I, if I didn't meet her, I, I would never have the story to share. And uh, nowadays I feel more fulfilled because I, I did find this story and it's now in, in, in a public engagement. Um, I'm inspired by, by documentaries, but the documentary and actually doing things in real life, it's always sometimes obscured, so I always tried to find the most out of what Kim Jong Un did by really deep research. Um, a lot of it, it's hard to do deep research when most of this history is censored and suppressed and marginalized and forgotten. No one really cares. I mean, who, who really care? And um, so that kind of moved me. I mean, just the the, the people ignoring the story. And I, like uh, when I'm in Korea, uh, I had a really because of these national security laws, I had to really go uh, very covert into researching and tell them that it's just a family project. I'm not doing anything about it. I'm not making a, uh, a big project out of it, blah, blah, blah. I, I actually was humble. I didn't really think I was going to make a, such a large project. But as things unfolded throughout the time I was there, um, the dictator's daughter was there, and she became president, and she started changing the history books, and then doing a lot of things, and she recently got impeached. But uh, during that time, um, artists were blacklisted, and the artists who were blacklisted were opposing that government. And many, those were many of my artists friends in Korea. Um, I may have been on the blacklist, but the, usually they just were just ignoring, ignoring me. Uh, you know, I'm just a Korean-American artist. There's not so much position between there because I'm a, a kyopo, and, and that is kind of a, already a discriminating word. Uh, and when I'm here, there's not much uh, artist community for Korean American artists because, like David said, that uh, it's more of an economic thing that we have to make jobs and do all these things, and we don't have time to make art. But my mother uh, always supported me, and um, I continued to make art. I made a lot of paintings and drawings and. Culturally, I'm producing something, but, but that, in theory, is, is because of the material excess that uh, uh, now we can benefit from. And I think that is, a, that is a struggle that I had is because, I mean, I, I wish I gave back to my mom before she passed away. I wish I could uh, pay for some kind of medical bills and whatnot. I mean, I was always there to take her to chemo and, um, you know, make her food and all that. And I, I'm glad I had the time to do that. Not like other people that are just really busy working and they need to survive that way. I, I managed to just live a very minimal life for a while and uh, was able to, I struggled to make this project. So I hope you guys can see it later. But let's just move on. So I actually have a question for you. Um, so, 
you know, I, I, seeing from all, everyone's introductions, I, I can find that there's this commonalities that people are often drawing from these personal experiences uh, in the work that they do. And because you know, Duke answered the last uh, or introduced himself last, I just wanted, uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how you see the role of, say, art and uh, political activists. Because if, say, the South Korean government is interested in, in suppressing some of these voices, uh, how do you feel maybe as an artist living in the United States and doing work here uh, as to how if your work can uh, is a part of this bigger political uh, scene? Or if, if it's not disconnected. Well, well, the thing is, is that this, this history that Kim Jong-un was a part of, it, 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 the family members don't really like to say the word exile, but it, it is a form of self-exile. So, um, you know, it, this kind of story is, is accepted in America. It's been accepted uh, since the, the foundations of America, right? I mean, through uh, religious persecution from England, uh, right? But uh, we also have another side of this story is that there's mass genocide of Native American people. Um, and and we, we, we don't talk about this often. And we, we forget about it in our consciousness. But aside from that, I mean, art and political activism, like I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm like this like archeologist trying to dig this past, this, this like ancient history, not even ancient, it's just like fossilized and, and forgotten. Um, I can say that is because it's a, uh, 103 year old man that was surviving, he contacted the Korean Resource Center. I went to go meet him and he, he remembered all this history. And he's like, wow, I can't believe you did this. And he, he's, the, he's like the last of his generation, right? And I have this little video and I recently did all this. And that kind of gave me the reassurance that I wasn't bullshit. You know, I'm like, wow, I have this 103 year old guy who like validated this whole thing. Um, and he knew, he remembered every single thing. And then, and then in the end he was like, but you forgot one part, and then you told the story. Um, I didn't record that, but uh, it was a nice story that you told me. Um, but I think nowadays, uh, in art, uh, there's a photographer named Nosa Tag, and he's actually been uh, documenting, a, he's a photojournalist artist, and he's been documenting a lot in Korea, and showing all these protests, and, and uncovering a lot of the uh, hypercritical things that are happening there. Um, and he's actually being shown in muse museums and whatnot. So I, I see that as kind of a very subver subversive success and very ironic because how are they funding uh, him as a, a, an artist who's talking about political s subjects with, when the grants from the government aren't allowing him to fund these kind of uh, political issues? Here we don't have any type of funding like that. We have grants. Um, but they're more privatized, so uh, it, it's depending on the who, who's actually granting them what they want, you know. Um, but in this project, I, I, I've had this, I, I strive for autonomy, and politically, archiving is actually, that was my political uh, tactic. Um, I'm not a, a person that is actively politically protesting and uh, making organizations and things like this for like you guys, but I'm more in the back trying to fuel you guys, I guess. Um. Well, you know, I think you guys want to comment on... Yeah, yeah. Just when we're working on this campaign, it's such a fact-based campaign. We're talking statistics of people dying, going bankrupt, all these different numbers and numbers and numbers, you know. And it, people don't always remember that. <laughs> you know that saying? It's like people don't remember what you say. They remember like how you make them feel. And art's a big part of that. You know, it's very impactful and appeals to different senses and it's abstract. <coughs> so then the viewer is allowed to kind of make their own relationship right with the with the art and I think that's important um, to appeal to different senses uh, fact-based like we're human beings and our expression is a huge part of any movement. Any, any major movement there's music you know there's songs there's art I mean you think about the Obama campaign you think about some of the iconic art that came out of that that lifted people that that propelled some people you know um, and I think most mass movements you'll see you'll see that you'll see iconic uh, imagery.
And actually, on, on that note, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us about uh, SB 516 in particular. What's the status of that campaign around the, if you introduce uh, the bill itself. Okay. Um, does everyone in here know what single payer is? Who doesn't know what single payer is? Okay. So right now, if you have insurance, maybe you get it through your business, maybe you don't have insurance, um, employer, school, your parents, you might find your parents' insurance if they're under 26. Um, that's a multi, multi-payer system, right? We've got many different payers, and each, each of these payers might have a different tier. Like you got gold, platinum, bronze, catastrophic. <laughs> a multi-payer system, different tiers, it's very complicated. A single-payer system puts everybody under one umbrella, right? Think like Costco, and you get bulk purchasing power so you can negotiate costs. Like, drug prices are super high, but I have some major economist friends, like people who like went to Oxford, Rose Scholars, they're like, that's the easiest thing for us to negotiate. Like, but we can't do it because we're all like split up, you know? And, and bulk purchasing power is huge. Um, that's how other countries do it. Um, so that single pair, so have one pair, and that would be, for single pair for us would be for the government, like to pull all the money, just like Social Security, right? The government's really good at paying checks. Paying the bills, government's really good at that. You know, when they try to convince you that, oh, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get paid as a doctor, like, not true. Medicare works really great. Um, when I first started working on this campaign, I had a doctor friend call me. I hadn't talked to him in 15 years, and from college he calls me, he's like, you're working on this? I was like, yeah, he's like, I hate Medicaid because I don't get paid enough. He's like, I get paid seventeen dollars a patient, and I can't run my office. He's like, but I can get, I can run my office on Medicare, and it's really easy because I don't have to wrestle on the phone with insurance companies, right? So you know when you go to a doctor's office and you see all these like staffers just on the phone all day? A lot of these people go to nursing school. They spend tons of money going to nursing school only to end up on the phone like wrestling with your insurance company. Like, oh, uh, I need to get this covered. Is it going to be covered? So insurance companies stand in the way many times of your, your doctor's care. Like, healthcare should really just be between your, yourself and your doctor, right? But then the insurance company will often come in like, oh, you need an MRI? Well, that's really expensive. You know, why don't you do six weeks of therapy? And if you need an MRI at that point, well, you know, we'll do it. But they'll have all these ways of just like interfering with healthcare. Or let's say you need a specialist, right? Like you go to your general practitioner, like, oh, you know, I don't fix broken knees. You know, you got to go to the specialist. What's the first thing they do? What insurance do you have? Let me see if they're in your network. And California actually has one of the fourth worst, uh, it's called a narrow network. So like in any given area you live in, let's say there's 100 doctors, most insurance carriers that you're with will only like allow you to see about 25% of those available uh, medical providers. Let's see, this is too much information for translation. <laughs> um, so anyway, my point is, um, single, that's what single pair is. You, you'd be able to see any doctor you want, right? And um, no co-pays, no deductibles. Um, they would do this through an increase in sales tax, so a 2.3% increase in sales tax, and also taxing, uh, it's called gross uh, receipts tax for businesses that make over $2 million, no, excuse me, that spend over $2 million, receive over $2 million, gross receipts tax. So the first dollar after um, two million is when they would be taxed. So pretty much every everyone across the board saves money, except for the very wealthy. If you make over two hundred and twenty, um, I think it's two hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars a year. So two hundred twenty-five or two hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars a year, you pay a little more. I think it's like a 06 percent increase. Because right now the wealthy get a subsidy for healthcare, believe it or not, through all the through all the uh, credits that they can um, what's it called deductions they can get. So, <laughs> right now the bill, it did pass the Senate, but um, it's sitting in this committee called the Rules Committee. It needed to go through the Assembly, so the way a bill works is it can either be written in the Senate or the Assembly. Ours started in the Senate, and if you start in the Senate, you get through that House, and then you got to go through the Assembly, right? And if any changes happen in the Assembly, it goes back to the Senate to uh, get approved for its revised version. So ours made it through the Senate, started in the Senate, but didn't get through the Assembly because it's stuck in rules because of a very special individual named Speaker Anthony Rendon, and um, <laughs> he decided to table the bill. Um, and we think it's because he's protecting, um, he's protecting some Democrats. And um, this is not a new fight. Single payer in California is not a new fight. Um, there's been previous versions of single payer 
Uh, let me give you an example. When Schwarzenegger was governor, the Democrats were able to get this bill through both houses and deliver it to the governor's desk. Schwarzenegger vetoed it twice, right? When Jerry Brown got to office, Democrat, you think, woo, this should be easy. We've gotten it to the governor's desk before. No. <laughs> Democrats, two of them voted against it, and four of them didn't vote at all. So it never made it to governor's desk. Got, he's already made it clear, and I spoke to an assembly person yesterday, that if this hit Brown's desk, he would veto it. So this, <laughs> the best way I can describe what we need to do Am I going beyond the scope of your question? Shall I say? The way this was described to me by a senator is all these lobbyists, when I go visit these legislative offices, I'm like, are you getting visited by insurance companies? Yes, they are. And they're getting misfed information. They're like, oh, the bill is going to cost $400 billion. That's not true. The bill is going to cost, the numbers we have are less and everybody would be covered. Right? So how many of you know or you don't have insurance? Know someone who doesn't have insurance or you don't have insurance, right? Everybody knows somebody. And that's ridiculous because we're such a wealthy country, but because pharma and insurance have such a hold on Washington and Sacramento, they're able to get away unregulated, get these crazy deductibles, right? You know what deductibles are? I'm afraid someone might be like 12 years old in here or something. Everyone knows what deductibles and co-pays are, right? The, those have just steadily gone up and you're also paying more of your premium, paying more to the premium. This idea of like having skin in the game, that's what insurance companies say. Oh, you should pay more, so we're all invested together. No, and so they can make more money. And um, the way a senator described it is all these lobbyists, like pharma, insurance, you know, auto, retail, oil, you name it, all these different lobbyists, they're like gorillas. And when one gorilla gets too powerful, the other gorillas get upset. So there's this natural checks and balances among the lobbyists. They kind of keep each other in check. They don't like it when the other industry gets too powerful. They want more attention for themselves. But when we show up, when we really show up, we're like the 800 pound gorilla. We're like the biggest gorilla and they get nervous. Because we can sit on anybody we want. And that's why they try to stop us. They put lies. You know, right now the media is saying this bill is going to cost $400 billion. They ran with that. What happened? I'm going to tell you about that number because you're going to read about it. Um, when this bill was going through our Senate, it has to hit this committee called Appropriations, which deals with the numbers. And when it hit that committee, that committee did a very shallow review. Just like a, they wanted to like look at the landscape, and they saw that, oh, currently California is spending 368 billion dollars on healthcare right now. That's everything you pay, what, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, everything, all the dollars that go into healthcare, 368 billion dollars. So they're like, okay, so what would it cost if we got everybody? Insurance, everyone coverage, you know, everyone health care, and many of us are underinsured, meaning your deductibles are so high, you avoid going to the doctor, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, like even if you have insurance, you're too scared to go to the doctor. You're like, I can't afford it right now, even though you're paying a premium every month. So that's called underinsured. So what if you got those people up to, you know, decent insurance, decent health care, to what healthy California with this bill would do? So they're like, oh, that would cost. Under the current system, that would cost $404 billion. Well, of course, our, our opponents of single payer, which is insurance, the underwriters, private hospitals, which make so much money, Kaiser are huge, they push back on this because they have like a, um, a private insurance component. Um, they took that number, they ran with it with the press, and when you have reputable media like LA Times saying, oh my god, this bill would cost $400 billion, which is not true, we're talking about the existing system, it, it muddies the waters and it confuses everybody and it's that everyone goes, we can't afford that, but the fact is this bill would cost less than that, it would cost $331 billion. It would cost less and would cover everybody. And that's what we're trying to do, that's what other countries do. And I'm taking up all the women in the room, I'm so sorry. But you need to show up. That, that's the point. We need to become that big gorilla, and we can talk about, you know, MLK, we can talk about Malcolm X, you can talk about all these leaders, but the fact is, when you're that dot in the crowd, and we make that big crowd, you see these South Korean protests? That's scary. You know, you can get what you want, right? And you got to show up. Um, we can talk about it. Um, I also wanted uh, to me uh, to introduce your work, too. So, if you want to talk about caravan before we get started, uh, can you guys help do this? Sign a petition? Uh, we're <laughs> <laughs> we're over 16. If you're over 16 now, you should sign it. One is for 
protecting DACA and uh, past the Dream Act. One is for DACA decision right act. Uh, yeah. So in the meantime, while you're at watch him bull and then listen to me. Right? Time outside the petition. Okay. So all right. Go. Uh, it's in Korean, but this is all Korean. That's what. Yeah. Adaptive citizenship, right? yeah. One is for adaptive citizenship right back. So, yeah. All right. Um, in April, um, I joined the Calvin Against Fear campaign. Um, it was a very intense campaign. Um, it was three weeks campaign from, start from, I think, Sacramento, so all the way to Texas. So we visit about more than 50 cities, and most of them are like a border, uh, I can say, border community. So nearby borders, a hundred mile border zone, we call, so-called um, yeah, death zone uh, for undocumented or immigrants. So uh, I was the only undocumented documented among the group, and I was the only Asian. <laughs> yeah, so it was like about 60 people there, Three lawyers and like many many media person. It's a close by national campaign, so people from Mexico, all the way from like uh, yeah different countries. And, and so uh, and given that I was kind of okay. Um, and DJ one day he called me, Jungle, um, why don't you just do just first part? And when when they get to the border. I think it's too risky, he said that, I remember that, but uh, um, if I don't join, no one no one represents documented and undocumented, then there's no point of me joining, so I said, I want to finish, I'll see how it goes, and then luckily I'm here, so, um, and three things I remember during the, during the campaign, one thing is burrito, I think I eat burrito morning, noon, and night. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. And, and another one is the action. We did like three or four actions per day. Very intense, very aggressive. Because uh, um, SIU don't want to initiate this, um, facilitate this uh, campaign. So, man, they do really, they, they're a fighter. And, and they occupy, we occupy the offices. We did a lot of ceremony at the offices. A lot of, Cops and three people, eight people got arrested. Yeah, by civil disobedience, and we occupied the street. You name it, I see that. <laughs> and, and it was very intense. And yeah, and I remember we uh, we passed ten checkpoints. I'm talking about checkpoint. Have you seen checkpoint? I'm being a, being a documented passing checkpoint. It's like <laughs> you're you're going. <laughs> it's, I can say, um, you know, you, this is the last thing you want to do, right? So, and we, there was 10, I think there were 10 bands, and um, given that I was the only one, I was the only undocumented, right, documented, and, and, and we have one attorney always follow me, <laughs> so I was very privileged. <laughs> I have my own attorney during the whole campaign, and they have to represent me. And, and and one day I remember, I mean, every time we pass checkpoint, they ask, oh, are you a you citizen? Right? Say no, and can I see your legal documentation? I usually take out uh, my work permit and, and, and whatnot. They check, you know, check the face, see if the face is right and <laughs> match. And okay, they just let us go. But one day I remember at the Texas border, they said, uh, hold on. And, they kind of, they kind of wait us, uh, you know, make us wait for 30 minutes and check all our IDs and I think they scan it. And after they scan it, I think they found out I'm a DACA method, right? I have a DACA. So, and, and they told us pull over. You know? So we pulled over the van. And then every, everyone freaked out, like, oh shit, oh shit. And ICE agent came back, I bought a board picture came, three board picture came back with the full vest. M16 with the K9 dogs, you know, and then boop, 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 roll, we rolled out the window, and then, who's John Kim? Can I speak to him? And I was in the, in the bag, and they called me, and I approached the front, and this is he, this is he, and said, 
why don't you step out of the van? I'd like to talk to him, you know, in person. I say no. <laughs> no. But if he, 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 you know, like when he asked me, it's like kind of very like, I don't know. He thought I would say, okay, and I say no. Kind of surprised, shocked, and I sort of told him, um, I'll remain silent from now on. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say anything until I speak to my attorney. He was in my, the other van. Can I call him? He said, he kind of still like kind of surprised. I, 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 he seems like he never get been rejected. Yeah, so, yeah, you kind of nod. <laughs> and I called him. I <laughs> want <laughs> 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 to. I'm fucked. You're going to call him for now. <laughs> so, he, so he, he, he jumped out of the van. He ran out. And, then, and I told him. My attorney will take care of it. And then, and then, and then I kind of film it. And then we, I, I, I put it in the YouTube. So and they said, no, you can't, you can't, you can't film it. You can't film it. So I said, well, I'm in the private band. First Amendment, right? Press, uh, free no press. So what can you do? Right? How do you know about, if I'm uh, recording you, the nature? They don't know, right? So I like, I like that mountain right behind you, and you're right there. And they said, Okay, and they didn't say anything. They couldn't say that because I'm saying I'm speaking the truth. So they they talked to my uh, my lawyers and about ten minutes, and they let us go. And I asked the lawyer attorney about what did they what did they want to ask? You know, they already asked me all the questions they're supposed to have, which is my you know my legal documentation. I already provided everything. What else did they need? And they said um, he said what kind of I go to what kind of work I do. Where do? What's the purpose of visiting Texas? Oh, nonsense! You know, totally irrelevant. Irrelevant to uh, my immigrant status. So, and uh, I say, uh, but he said uh, all the stuff you, you ask, you, you don't. You're not gonna answer any question. Um, by not answering your your questions, is he going to be detained? I say no. Okay, and we can we go and do that. So that's how we got away from it. So that's how intense action was. And, and, and third thing I remember is uh, community. Um, so we we eat the stuff, whatever the community, because we visit a very small community, um, a population of 10,000, 5,000. And out of ten thousand, out of ten thousand, five thousand people are, 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 are documented. So in the census, only five thousand, but people live there like ten thousand. You know, sorry about. So we visit those communities, and um, they're really happy to see us because never, they never seen any any group of people visit them because, uh, um, to see them, uh, um, uh, um, to listen to their stories, stuff like that. It was very hard. I've, this, I've heard like so many uh, heartbreaking stories. I never, I could even, I can say, uh, could even imagine. Um, one of the story I remember is the borders on. Um, the, I can't really relate to Kim Sang Dong's project. If you see the project, you know, on the panel, the channel, you can see that like, um, like police hit, you know, like beat. The, people, right? Uh, brutalized and criminalized. I thought it was like back, I mean, I, I don't think, I never thought it can, it can be happening in the United States of America, 2017, right? Maybe, because, uh, um, but, huh? First. And, and, and well, I've seen many community members from like uh, in border zone, because they're 100 mile border zone, like I said, death zone, so, that means border patrol have full authority, discretion, so they, whatever they can do. So they can shoot. They just say, they, they shoot someone, and then they can say, just, oh, he looks suspicious, that's it. And then no one can sue them. If someone sue them, and, and federal government, they just, they don't take anything. So, and a lot of community members, they lost their family member. They even want to call her. She lost five family members, five. five. And, and she hasn't found any of their bodies. Because the uh, federal government, they reject to cooperate to collect their bodies. Because uh, they can't use, the body can't be used as uh, evidence against them, right? Because they might shot in 
the head is by the law, international law, something like that, you can't do that. Right? You have to, something like that. So I don't know the detail about it, but, and they show the photos of the people killed, and 3,000 people killed from 2009, now 2017, and, and 1,000 1, bodies were not collected. And, and those community members came to me and shared their story and they showed me their like, family members' photos and bodies are all... Oh, I thought, it's, I mean, it's, how can it be happening in America in 2017, right? And we don't know about it, right? And no media um, want to cover it. And I've, I've seen that, and, 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 and by, by listening to their story, hearing their story, and we come with the action of we can't do it, we can't just sit, sit here, let's, let's do something. And then with a lot of the actions, we came up, came up, up like organically. Yeah. So, um, and yeah, one of, another story is, um, I remember is, there's a, uh, there's a permanent checkpoint. If you guys pass San Diego, there's permanent checkpoint, right? And if you towards towards the border, 20 miles, even 20 miles border, you call like I don't know what they call, but it's it's just it, a lot of people um, not only die, people leave there. Um, I think the border patrol. They can set up whatever, whatever um, they want to set, which is like temporary checkpoint within the 20 miles. So let's just say if they want to check, set up the checkpoint in front of the school, they can do that. So and people leave there, right? And kids kids going to school. So when when, when we visit the Arivaca, I remember the Arizona, and then there's always like permanent checkpoint within 100 miles. But let's just say there's no checkpoint within uh, me my my home to my daughter's school. But in the last five years, okay. So she never carry his legal documentation, right? Because she never sit, uh, go through the checkpoints. You never have to uh, carry that. So every, every day when he drop off his his daughter some, uh, um, to school, just wear um, whatever the clothes and just drive a license, right? The next day, one night, the board decided decide to set up a temporary checkpoint, and he does. How how could he know, right? The next morning, he just. Um, drop off his daughter as usual and go and there's boom, temper checkpoint, right? When they when they going through Border Patrol can ask their, you know, legal documentation one. Now he doesn't have it. So he step out of it, which is that he doesn't have to, but he's not supposed to, but he did. And then other twenty people did. And and he said, Oh, I gotta drop off my kids. You know, his she's right here. Can I go? Okay, I'll let you go, just sign here. Which is a waiver, give up of, of their um, permanent residency. Can you believe that? And 20 people lost their permanent residency. So right after they sign it, right, and drop off our kids, come back, and three hours later, ICE agent, boom, great. So he pick 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 them up and drop off drop off uh, drop them off at the Mexico, and after like towards the five hours, right, and kid. Waiting for his dad, he's not coming, right? Found out his dad deported. So those kids um, went to the foster. I, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable stories. I mean, yeah, so I thought it was a, that being as undocumented, I thought it was oh, going a really hard time, man. It's, I, I went through a difficult time, but by seeing that, well, this, yeah, it's all totally different. So, um, um, yeah, so I became much more humble and, and um, try to like raise the voice as much as I can um, by sharing the story. Because that's what they want, um, that's what I promised to them. Um, yeah, so, okay. Uh, and this is this is for everybody, and we'll go back to this one. You know, given the, all the different challenges that we've heard about, um, 
what 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 what's going to happen in the future? Like, what do you think? Uh, or what should be happening now? Uh, what can people do to get involved? Um, I'd like everyone to, to continue on with the various campaigns that we've discussed, and uh, we also want to open it up to the floor too. So if you guys have any questions, you'll have a chance to ask those. Right now, um, we're doing a citizen, citizenship for all campaigns, um, like the petition we're um, uh, you guys are signing right now. This one of it. And also, we're planning, right now, the DACA is on the chopping block, right? And also, DreamAct was just, in, just introduced. Um, so we're planning another action on August 15, because uh, it's fifth year anniversary of DACA, and we try to do a 24 hours with Virgil in, 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 in DC, um, till maybe in September 5th, because that's, um, Nine states, and with including Texas, this was um, this, this is the day they tell um, Trump it doesn't he doesn't repeal it in the day he's gonna they're gonna sue it or not. So um, that's the action we're planning. So uh, I mean, and, and also the band tour uh, we're planning, but. Um, which we try to start from like OC, local first. So the band tour is one of the, like, I can say, it's a, a, a mobile KRC. This, 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 yeah, mobile KRC, yeah. KRC, same KRC, but pretty the band, and we just visit the communities and provide the service they need, like naturalization, DACA, renewal, or, or yes. And then, um, and, and health, Health and also housing, and also advocacy and organizing. So this part we're planning, but we're doing the fundraising right now. A dollar campaign. Anyone who can donate dollar, you guys can, right? And, and, and put a dollar and five dollar, ten dollars. And we try to buy the van. Um, you guys are more than welcome to join the van uh, um, and, and drive the van. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, that's what we're doing right now. Um, yeah. Move away. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. I feel like I'm speaking. I speak too much. Yeah. So after the caravan against fear campaign, um, I thought about how can I really help the people who live far. You know not living in the city, big city. Like OC and LA is kind of big city, right? But people live in like Arivaca, you could probably never heard of it, right? Uh, um, the small cities in Texas, in Arizona, in New Mexico, those people I cannot visit. I cannot see them every day. It was very difficult for me to reach out. And there's no, they have no reception and, and stuff like that. But those, their people live there and, and, and they need to know what their right is, they have right to ex exercise their rights, like I did at the checkpoint, right? I was very fortunate because I was very informed. I was not, I, not, not because I was brave, because I knew what I had to say, that's why I say no. And, and, and no brave man can say no without knowing, you know, what their right is. Because with the M16, with the K9, I don't think they can say, you know? <laughs> so yeah, so um, that's what I thought, well how can I really, uh, let them know and train them, like educate them, like and but um, so that's why I come up with the we can come up with the know your right app. So it basically all the know your right stuff in the, in, the, in the app. But um, and one of the requirement one was you don't um, you can not, you have to use it you have to, you can use it without reception, phone reception because in many area in, in the nearby border no reception. Before the reception, so because guy, uh, um, yeah, and, and me and KRC and Nakase and also a uh, volunteer from Google, um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, so we, we create this app and we, we launched it like a couple months ago, and now right now it's five different languages, right? Korean, English, um, Spanish, Chinese, and Portuguese. And we're looking for more volunteers who can tra translate into different languages, Arabic, 
Cambodian and stuff like that um, anymore. And yeah, the apps consist of Know Your Right, Basic Know Your Right, and Hotline, 24, 24 Hotline, so they can reach out to a uh, live person when they're in, in, in crisis. Just to clarify, that's a mobile app. Mobile app. Yeah, it's an Android. Okay. Yeah, but we're still having a hard time. Or can I say that? Okay. Uh, um, app. I mean, I, we have a problem with iTunes right now. No, not really. They reject reject our app because they say it's it's not entertainable. <laughs> well, of course, it's not. It is entertainable. <laughs> Yeah, 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 so, and then you keep rejecting it, and then you keep rejecting it. Uh, huh? Educational. Educational is for, um... Yeah, yeah. Educational law. Yeah, it's not attainable, it's not fancy, you know? And then, because they're expecting, well, from walking sign, and then... Yeah, something, but... I mean, all volunteers was like Google, like soft engine, they know what they do, right? But the reason why we make it simple, because... It's for the people who don't speak English, who don't know how to use smartphone that much, who don't who don't have the uh, phone reception. That's why it makes so simple. Everybody can understand. So that's why no tap, only like slide it, slide it. Everyone can use it. And, and, and yeah, so visible as possible. We spend so much time and energy into to make the app that everybody, 50, 60 years old, who don't speak any English, can understand and use it. Right. So. And we try to explain it, but they're still rejected. Boom, boom, boom. Not fancy enough, not fancy enough, not, not entertaining. I have a walkthrough for a video game of play that's terrible, and it's on there for iPhone. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> which, yeah, we try to send an appeal letter to like uh, Kevin DeLeon and to send a message to, to, to uh, uh, Apple lobbies, but still, still, yeah. No, I don't is, know. There, is there anywhere? Is there anywhere? Yeah, this is what we're trying to do, but um, yeah, we try to do it. I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, if you know anyone, let me know. Definitely, it'd be, it'd be great. Uh, um, but it seems like the Google employees, they don't really you know, have a good relationship with Apple. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. And then and I think Googlers really believe in, in, in Google way, which is open and open sources and stuff like that and, and, and yeah so I so I think it's a shame using an iPhone now. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's okay. yeah so yeah this is what's going on and then the third option third third feature is um, actually as an audio file it will speak on behalf of the person. The person does they don't just can't they don't speak English or even if they speak English they don't know what to say, the inject verbiage, right? Uh, um, yeah, if they say lie, it's, 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 it's not good, so, yeah. So if you can download, you can download it, um, Android, App Store. And it's called Know Your Right. Know Your Right with the face, like this. Okay. Yeah, with the icon, with the face icon. Yeah. We should put a middle finger, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, boom, like, but then it'll be entertaining. Then it'll yeah. be exciting. Yeah, 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 more stylish. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay, actions. So the bill right now, like I said, is table. It was supposed to go through the assembly. The speaker of the assembly said, no! Hold it, not going anywhere. Put it in the rules committee, and it's there indefinitely. Um, I think the likelihood of starting back in January is more likely than getting the speaker to bring it out of the committee and let it go forward uh, because he has not budged. He's looking for allies. Like when Planned Parenthood is unsupported, we're all like, "What are you doing?" Um, so, what can you do? So, since February, when the bill when the bill came out till now. You, you, you've heard about single payer. You've heard about SB 562, right? Or you've heard people say health care is a human right, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Like, that's getting louder. And it's happening all over the country. Like, town halls in every state. Like, people are like, we all deserve health care. You have VAs, like, veterans standing up saying, I have health care. All these people should have health care. So, people are fighting for it. We're getting louder. But still, there are people you're going to meet that don't know what this is, right? Um, so talk to your friends and family. 
It's very important. It's hard. I have a, I live next to a Trump supporter, and I decided I'd talk to her about single pair, and she was like, uh-uh. And then a couple weeks later, I think she forgot that we had that conversation. She's now, she thinks everyone should have health care. She doesn't remember talking to me about it. <laughs> I was like, whoa, look at that seat. Yeah. But she's, you talk to people because it's fiscally the more responsible thing to do. Um, Warren Buffett's for it, if you know who he is. He's like one of the wealthiest people in the world. Um, his Republican partner, Charlie Munger, is for it. If you do the research, it's, it's the smarter way to go. Um, phone calls. If you don't know who your assembly person is, who your senator, state senator is, look it up. Just Google who is my representative. And a link will come up and you can put your address in and it will show you who your two representatives are. Call them. If you're scared of these calls, it's the easiest thing. How many of you have done legislative calls? Just called your legislative office? Oh, pretty good. Um, for those of you who haven't, if you're, if you're scared, or it's boring, or whatever it is, just call. It's the easiest thing. You're basically a number. They're going to ask you what your zip code is, maybe your address. Um, they'll put it in your tally mark. That's all it is. They're not going to argue with you. you know, and if you're embarrassed, just call them after hours and leave a voicemail. Um, legislative visits? Yeah, question. Yeah, it's, some, it's not even like, yeah, it'll be an aide or something. Um, so nothing to fear. Um, legislative visits, if you go in, you may talk to an aide also. How many of you done visits before? That's so impressive. Okay. My big thing, some people go in, they're really angry, they have personal stories, and they're super mad, and they like, want to go in and blame and accuse. I don't suggest that. Whether you're talking to a friend, it's easy to get into arguments about ideological differences. But when you have a person going like this, right? They're like, whoa, and their guard's up. You're like not going to get information in there. So, right? If you're fighting, like no one wants to listen to you. Just gonna, it's like sports. Like people get more as you get closer to the to the finals, right? People get even more vehement about their side, right? And everyone else is wrong. And they start saying nasty things to each other. Like we don't want that. Listen, listen to people, same thing with your legislator. Listen to what they have to say, even if it's in disagreement with you. And try to turn those points slowly, right? And maybe like my Trump neighbor, they'll come around over time. Um, that's really it. I have sign-up sheets if you want to get involved with this bill. Like, uh, there's email updates. Just do it. <laughs> Force it, okay. And um, thank you. That is all I got. Get involved. So I guess uh, uh, after this project, I'm actually uh, still continuing the research. I actually found a photograph at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, I've been looking for this photo for three years. Uh, it's a colored photo now. I thought it was black and white. Um, but uh, uh, in that archive, I actually found a lot more things. Uh, the founder of this KRC, he has a folder in there. It uh, shows his political asylum visa was granted. Um, I'm, I'm obtaining more and more information and, and data and archives in order to just, just to save up ammunitions. Uh, you know, uh, I, this archive, it's a big project because um, the government still hasn't recognized this person. Um, I, I applied to a, a thing for when he was, he did a lot of the, uh, the independence movement stuff. And I, I showed facts and I, I submitted the application during Pancané and uh, they rejected it saying there was not enough information. Um, they, I think they just blatantly rejected him because they knew how subversive this guy was and they don't want this kind of person uh, in a uh, Korean uh, political sphere because how dangerous uh, and, and strong political activism is in Korea. But uh, now that uh, the times have become more democratic maybe, that it, it may be able to, uh, some access where uh, this relative will get known more, um, but still today he's uh, s suppressed. Um, that's the status of this figure. And uh, it, it's going to be a struggle with, uh, with, the, with the artists between the institution to, to pass on this archive and, and getting to, to more reaching out to know this figure and reflecting on this. Uh, Kim Song Nun, it's actually the installation when you first walk in. There's like eight numbers. Oh, yeah, if you go that way, it's, it's there. It'll be up for another week or so.
Oh, so so this relative, um, he was the first voted sole mayor after the 12-year dictatorship of recent month, or the regime, I guess, or autocratic regime. Um, but during that regime, he actually was trying to fight for this na uh, against this uh, national security law, which actually reinforced the, the civil disobedience and people getting arrested just uh, talking about communism or talking about just things or slander or sedition. Um, so the April Revolution, so this was passed uh, in 1958. The, this national security law, and it was very severe. Um, I guess we're talking about that because of uh, DACA and border politics. Um, and basically, the national security guard, how the liberals passed it was that um, it was supposed to thwart any kind of uh, communism in South Korea itself and contain it and obtain, uh, uh, detain anyone who was this kind of way of thinking. And it's kind of a social cleanse. Um, they opposed it for, you know, about a month, and the Democrats were doing a sit-down strike inside the National Assembly, and they were forced out by 300 police officers. Um, in history, they don't talk about how, they, how the liberals actually kicked them out of the police. Brutal force, it's in the film. Um, and still today, they, they don't talk about that part even in, in the mainstream media. Um, and, and I've tried to make an essay film about that and, and cover this, but that law is still in place today in Korea yeah. and has uh, significantly uh, created oppression. Um, like for instance, if they knew that I was doing such a project 20 years ago, they would probably jail me. I'd probably be in jail right now uh, on sedition or defamation charges. Um, today, I, I guess I, I somehow I, I passed through the airport with many hard drives. Um, most of the archives are all in, in America. I actively try to get everything from Korea to America. Maybe it's a little safer, but uh, there's other organizations and organizations who are trying to actively uncover a lot of uh, history that has been. Uh, sanitized. So I'm, I'm on more of the back burner, you know. Um, maybe later on in the future when this health care passes or doesn't pass, there will be a whole archive about why it didn't pass and we can make an analysis of it. I mean, we talk about uh, statistical data. Um, this is hugely fact-based. Um, the archive is important for these things. I mean, I have I have uh, more archives on my mom's medical process than uh, uh, this political project, but um, I'm now trying to use these archives and and talk about healthcare in a way in art. Uh, I don't think a lot of artists do talk about healthcare. I mean, and it's a serious thing. What do you think your project? As, as of now, like, what is it about your subject, do you think, prevents uh, him from being acknowledged by the government? What did he do? What did he represent? Oh, he, he represented the people. So originally he was a farmer. Um, he, he studied in Japan. He, was, he had friends that were uh, uh, politically jailed in Japan for uh, being against the emperor, and they're trying to assassinate the Japanese emperor during Japanese colonization. Um, there was... Uh, he was a part of uh, trying to decolonize Korea by catching, uh, trying all the Korean collaborators that helped the Japanese colonize Korea. Um, they stopped that. They stopped a lot of things that he was trying to resist. Um, he was telling a lot of people that uh, Park Jung was going to be a dictator in the 60s. Um, and um, right when he passed the Yushin Constitution in the floor, um, finally people started believing him or just thought he was crazy. Um, but. I mean, there, there was a lot of people who believed in this person for quite some time. He was a very famous person in the older generation. But like, uh, my, my parents were born into the dictatorship, so they were born in 57. And that generation, our parents, they have no recollection because they're not taught history. Uh, it's not mandatory there. Um, and, and many of the books, when you look at history books that were published in the 70s, it has the, um, the dictator's face first. And then the history of like 
the industrialization of Korea and how great it, it, it rapidly modernized. So this is like the perpetual uh, propaganda that continues for how uh, successful Korea became today. I mean, of course, the, the modernization was incredible. Have you um, read a modern Korean fiction like Bryce Walton? No, I haven't. It's exactly about that. So my professor, as you mentioned, Bryce, Bryce, Bryce Walton is a Department of Korean Studies expert. He's actually, it's yeah. really talk about his person. But sure. um, I'm letting you know that like, this, this movement that's been going on, like, this like, archive, it's been going on at UCB. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. the constant lack of funding and like the size of the like policies and the lack of like Korean attention and stuff. Like, so it, archiving is very important, but I also think about like reaching out and talking about this. Yeah, Derrida uh, writes a book about the power of the archive, right? Um, there's other there's other uh, people who say that the the archive should be in the power of the people because if it's in an institution, then they're the ones who can direct what is knowledge and, and what history can be. And so that's why uh, I, I was going to many of these institutions in Korea and trying to extract as much data as I can and uh, use them as a collaboration. Uh, and proving them that, that proving to the audience that there is some kind of censorship that's going on with these institutions. Um, and that was my collaboration because I was trying to, um, so to answer your question about, um, as I said before, the government doesn't fund any kind of these, these type of projects. Like you said, archiving is not a necessary thing going on. But there's but, an entire underground network that too, but in the institution as well, they've been making a, a tremendous amount of archive institutions. There's so many archival centers in Korea now, but what they're archiving is not uh, these kind of political movements. They're archiving other things that kind of more solidify the, the re regimed knowledge, right? Um, and that's what I'm trying to break. But it's I mean, it, it's, 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 it has to, the archive has to be in the power of the people. Um, have you considered sharing your work with these other academics? Um, that could help you piece different, can they probably have their own spheres of information that they can plug this into? Oh, yeah, yes, definitely, but uh, they, they also, in these programs, when they're funded, they also have their own uh, perpetual uh, idea of, what, why the program is formed that way. Like I went to the Ethnic Studies Library and, and they have a different uh, uh, way of seeing what the library is used yeah, it's, for. It's more on like the administrative side of the city. It's constant. Like, like, but, but the institution also is, is supposed to oppress um, these, 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 like Chicano studies for instance, is supposed to oppress the Ch Chicano knowledge. These, these, the these academic department is a very important department. I think there's a huge misconception of how it's presented because people are very amazed. Like, oh, you see that these are very progressive school and there's so many protests, but that's not how the actual is. So that's why I don't, I don't really have academic institutional support as well as uh, governmental support. I'm actually just a very autonomous artist yeah. and, uh, and, 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 I, and I try to retain that way. Um, yeah, um, since we have uh, stayed apart now, and I wanted to uh, open it up for questions for the floor. You know, I know we're getting artists in dialogue, but don't talk to everyone else. Uh, just one last question for you, uh, because the exhibit's going to be wrapping up in a week. Uh, will people will people be able to uh, see it elsewhere uh, after it's uh, uh, finished here at KRC? I don't know what your plans are. If you could talk a little bit about that, and then we could bring it up to the so I, I actually um, applied to the Center for Asian American Media. Um, they they denied the the film because I, I still need to do more editing and whatnot. Because this, this is kind of an installation format, and they want to see an actual documentary with people talking and whatnot. So um, I, I have to do a little bit more filming. Um, and, and I, w I would plan to do that, but 
Uh, I've had some ideas where I could just like upload all the data on the internet and, and then like make a little internet like open source thing. But then I also question that too, if, if that's the right uh, and effective way. Um, ha exhibiting it here is, is probably one of the most effective uh, ways, and I, and I would like to see this as a model where I can continue using it in, th in this way. I mean, um, the Center for Asian American Media, I've done some more research, uh, the Central Broadcasting Corporation actually censored the, the documentary about the Korean War in the, back in the 70s, I've been looking through these UCLA archives. And so I'm a little skeptical about this corporate uh, broadcasting. So, so i got to be very careful where this film goes um, in order to, remain, to re retain that autonomy um, and not be completely dominated by this institution. Then, then I lose the power of the archive. Right? And, and, and so it's strategic. It has to be very, it's very political. Um, in, in, in the next movement. So I, I don't know uh, the next plan, what this is actually going to happen. Um, I mean, like she says, she's very right. It's, it's, the project is, is very underfunded. And, and, and the only support I had was through my money and also through their, through their family. Um, no other ins institution. I mean, there's no serious relative. relative. Um, or distant relative. Uh, they, a lot of academics speak about these kind of histories, and, and they know a lot about it, but, I mean, this is a figure that actually was doing these things, but they're never acknowledging it. So that, that, that's, I mean, uh, in terms of, like, writing, that, that needs to be changed, you know? Um, I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's something that I have to actively crack. You know? I mean, it makes me think of like building movements. Like sometimes it's leadership led. You know, you, you get the big names, the big political stars come together, and so like, oh yes, they said to do this. This is what we're going to fight for now. But sometimes it's just the masses driving it. And I think like in your case, like if you if you made like let's say you did the documentary for the for the museum. And, and, and the story was compelling for an audience, and, and the figure sticks with us, and that, that his name, you know, he, he becomes a figure in our minds, and you can slowly popularize it grassroots style versus taking it to an academic and expecting them to, you know, break into their world of knowledge if, if that's not the route you want to go. But. Yeah, well, I mean, Achilles Membus does talk about these things, that the resurrection of the archive, and, and usually the state, feel like, uh, or they try to oppress as much as they can until the conscious, in the social conscious, they don't remember. But, and so they, so they free themselves of this debt. So in Africa, there's a lot of reconciliation going on, but there's also severe repression going on to just forget about what just happened in, in, in this land, right? It's architectural. Um, but once you remove this archite uh, architecture and people forget about these buildings, that have this colonial residue or these atrocities and traumas, um, the state doesn't have no more debt, and when they don't have the debt and, and the people don't have the archive, there's no way to resurrect, but if they do resurrect it, then the, then the state now has debt and they have to, again, there's going to be more severe repercussions. So I, I, I mean, I expect that the, there will be continual resistance of uh, accepting this project, but uh, I'm really happy that DRC Except this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. So, you know, we, we have a few minutes left. Uh, if there are a few questions we can, if, if for any of the uh, panelists up here. Uh, yeah. Um, you wanna, I don't know if you want to come up here. It's okay. I'll just kind of talk louder. Um, I have a question for um, you. Um, but um, you said you aren't completely sure where you're going to put the exhibit next. Um, I, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Okay, um, is there like any way we could like follow your media or anything? Excuse me. Is there any way we can like follow your like, social media or something so we can? I have a very follow. personal Instagram account. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. I, mean, you know, I like I like chopping watermelons with a knife. <laughs> 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 
it's no, no, it's, it just it just feels good. <laughs> but I, I don't I don't I don't uh, use websites. I don't have a website. I don't I like whatever is uploaded. You just Google my name and things come up. But I don't like <laughs> like it, like I usually would rather have like a private meeting. Like I, when when people want to see my work, I, they just come to my studio and I just like show them all the stuff and they're like, what? Wow. You know? But I don't have, there's no social media presence for this relative. It's, it's more in, in the, kind of the backgrounds. They don't work Could you share your email with them then? Yeah, the email, email would be good. Um, where did, where did Jungle go? Oh, DJ can type it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, if you want, it's uh, Duke, Duke, uh, O-N-E-E -E at Hotmail. O N E E at Hotmail. Onni. <laughs> I don't know, I always wanted to be like an onni. Any other questions? Uh, um, Ms. Chang, you said, you said that um, uh, several Democrats opposed the single parent bill. But uh, I thought that uh, Republicans would generally oppose it. Um, you know, right? So right now we have a super majority, right? So in the Senate, there's 40 members, right? And in the um, Assembly, there's 80 members, twice that, right? We have more than half for each house, right? So we should be able to pass this bill. We have to pass a fiscal bill where there's financing involved. You actually have to get two thirds majority. Um, and we have a super majority is when, a majority is just when you simply have more, more than half. But we have a super majority, we have two thirds for each house. So we should be able to pass any bill we want, but we can't because people are voting against it. Um, the, the bill that they voted against previously, that's not this bill, this is a years ago bill for single pair. So, am I answering your question? Yeah. You, you, do, you do need a, you need to get all the votes. And so there's, there's a couple ways you can pass a bill. The legislative process, the legislative route, where you get your legislators to vote for it, you don't vote, right? And then there's a ballot measure, where you vote. Do you guys know what Prop 61 is? Yes. It was supposed to lower drug prices, right? And you were able to vote on it, I could vote on it, the people vote on it. Pharma put in over $100 million, it made it one of the most expensive propositions in California history, and they just advertised it against, against it. Like, so people voted against their own interests, and so Prop 61 failed. We failed to lower drug prices in California, and they, they fear-mongered us. They said, oh, if you do this, like, we won't have drug research. They have like, all these lies, you know? Most of drug research happens with public funding. Um, but that's schools, yeah, academia. So that's why they chose to take the legislative route this time. And that's why our job is now to like scare the heck out of our legislators and let them know that we want this bill, we want single care. Um, and what's happening in California is reverberating throughout the country. Like all eyes, like they're watching New York, they're watching California. And it's, it's, it's exciting people. Um, we're changing the narrative. We're, we're dominating the narrative that pharma used to dominate, you know. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Jun Wu. Yeah. Um, so, um, how's how, 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 It's okay. <laughs> how have you experienced alienation as an immigrant? Because you're an immigrant. So or again, any other nation? Any nation like being um, separated from groups because you're not documented? Have you ever experienced that? Um, can you elaborate? Like, uh, like how separate? Like alienation. alienation. Yeah, alienation. Yeah, it means like. I feel isolated. Uh, yeah, because you're because you're not documented like other people. Have you ever felt that? Um. Yes. Um. You mean. Because you're not okay. Let me let me rephrase it. Okay. So, um, have I met any any people any anyone who don't have a DACA? That's what you're saying. So that's why the, the alienation alienation. No, because from the because being undocumented. Uh -huh. Have you ever felt basically separate from others or lonely or isolated? Oh, helpless. Okay. 
I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, okay. Um, I can talk. Let's start off my personal life. Definitely, I came here when I was 15 because not because I wanted, but because I was sent to here. And I haven't seen because my my parents, my family got bankrupt or something. 1999, Korea got IMF, so got basically bankrupt. So my parents got divorced. And I got a plane on um, Friday night. I remember Friday night, my mom called me and, and, and she gave me a, you know, in Korea, if you got bankrupt, call, they put a red, uh, red sticker on, 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 on every single thing you own. We call, we call it cha in Korea. It's basically, the government owns it. So it's not, it's not, it's no longer yours. Basically, uh, even the toothbrush, they put a red, yeah, everything. Yeah, bankruptcy laws in Korea are completely different in Korea. They'll take everything. Yeah, so I've, I've seen everything it. Everything from me. Then it, okay, and, and and my mom called me Friday, and I remember that and they gave me plane ticket with a um, passport, and she said I, I had to go, I had to leave, I had to go to America. When? Sunday. So I thought, why is that? Oh, isn't that? You could you could visit. You could just mm -hmm. for a vacation, but. How can it be vacation? I'm still going to school. I mean, summer, summer, summer oh, vacation is two months away, you know. No, you have to take a little vacation, okay? And then I took the play. I came here and, and by myself with my sister. My sister was 17 back then. And, and yeah, I was 15. And, I, and since then, I haven't seen it, her, spoke to my dad, never. And my mom also. Uh, right now, it's, luckily, she's still alive and she's, she's still live with me right now. Uh, but 18 years, I've only seen her five times. Yeah, and, and um, because she also got she got sick, she got lupus, stuff like that, and she couldn't really travel. And, and so I had to, I think I felt lonely, right? And, and no one to take care of myself. And I had an aunt, but she, Everybody, because I went through the adolescence, you know, like childhood, rough, you know, and the school I, I went to was public school, but 95% Latinos, so I think uh, only 20 Asians, so they believe on me, believe a lot, you know, uh, uh, but they thought I was, was um, like very, what can I say, rich, they have a, like a preconceived notion of Asians are rich. <coughs> you, I was exactly opposite, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, yeah, and, and remember in my high school years, the only thing I remember, like, fight, 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 you know, try to survive, try to survive. Not only that, only I had to work two jobs. And I remember only, you know, um, I can say, um, the class, I only always sleep, you know, and I'm so tired. And, even, I couldn't speak any English, right? So teacher always see, uh, I think they thought I was drugy or something. But they called the police, police came and check my, check my pew pew and they say something, they asked me something, but I said, oh, always okay, but I didn't understand what they're saying. <laughs> okay, 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 they let us go, let me go, and they call me you know, next week, again, every week. So, and at the PE, you know, I got bullied a lot, and I fought a lot with the Mexican gang, I can say, cholos. And, and I got stabbed twice, and, and I've seen gun twice. This, yeah, it's, 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 it was bad. Uh, I, I went to Buena Park High School like 18 years old, 18 years ago. It was not like now. Yeah, very, very ghetto uh, um, back then. Now it's really good. Uh, change a lot. And still, we have a lot of things to do. But anyway, yeah. So can. Yeah. yeah, I went through that period and also um, I already shared this story with the youth. The youth. Um, I couldn't go to college right after 18 when I had to graduate high school because back then um, if, you, if you're not documented, you can't really afford. Um, if you're undocumented, you can't. It's very difficult to uh, get an tuition. I mean, I think impossible. So I couldn't. So um, um, so I worked 
not 60 years to save enough money. I think it was enough money I could go. So to, at, at age, age of 24, I applied for Cypress College. I got rejected. My application got rejected because um, but, um, this is the same thing. Um, if you're not uh, documented and if you don't have um, international student or visa or something like that, you have to pay. Uh, you have to pay for. If you don't, yeah, either you go back to your country or pay international student fee, which is a ridiculous amount of money. But I know 8540 was passed. That, uh, um, but there's no Asian um, the public received that. Uh, um, and, and I couldn't find anything about uh, related to AB 540 in any Asian media, anything. Only Latinos. So, and I, and I try to call like, every lawyer I can find and Google, you know, free, I can say free bono? Yeah. Pro bono, pro bono, sorry. Uh, pro bono, and, and they, they don't want to help me because they know they, they can make any money out of it. So. And I found KRC, it was 10 years ago, 2006, 7, 6, 6, yeah. And because uh, I remember the, in the newspaper, they said, buy me any free legal consultation, something like that. So that was it, that was it, right? And only home, so I go and uh, I met Joe and Lee, and then I didn't, I only have five minutes, right? And then <laughs> we were trying to say, you can't get in five minutes, but she, she was really kind and she said, Come down, boy. Come down, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and she kind of looked through it and I said, what is that? It's an AB 540. Um, it's an institution now, you know, the undocumented folks like me can get an institution. And she never heard about this. So, okay, you no, know, for me to help you, I need to get, I need, uh, I need to, you need to go through, I need to go through the KRC that I can do it. So, okay, she introduced me to KRC and that's how um, I got to you know KRC. And, we filed the whole, I think, the litigation letter, sent a letter, letter to Cypress College. And of course they rejected. They they say uh, we, got, we don't want to accept it. So okay. Uh, we um, we got more pissed off, so we recruit ACAU members, you know, and got bigger. So we we filed lawsuits against Orange County District. Four district college, maybe twelve. Yeah, and then they say same thing. Okay, after six months, we say if, if you don't uh, um, remember that, if you don't, this is last letter to settle. If you don't this, if you don't, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, against against okay, something million dollars. We talk about the money. Remember, remember the money. That, and then, but finally they saw the <laughs> so the number, uh, 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 yeah, I, uh, and they they say okay. The vice president sent me an uh, email about I'm sorry, I'm not okay. So after six months, I got in. Yeah. And that's how I got through the college, high school, and yeah. Thank you. So uh, to close, I know that uh, you know John has got this box of money in front of him, so you may be wondering about that. Uh, I'm just going to pass the mic down really quickly. So for each panelist, if you could just spend like you know just a minute, really quick, just any last questions or you know if you want to, if you have like, contact information you'd like to share, if you want to plug something really quickly, um, we'll go through that and then uh, we'll wrap up. And I think. Uh, if you guys are interested, the panelists may be around for a few more minutes or a little longer. You can always talk to them as well. So, okay, um, let's let's do chanting. Uh, let's get up, get up, stand up. Let's do it. Let's do it. I don't need a microphone for that. I need y'all help. All right, what to do? If I say, what do we want? You say, dream it. And if I say, when do we want? Say now. Okay. What do we want? Dream it.
morning, noon, and night. All right? <laughs> Why are we here? To fight for justice! How long will we fight? Morning, noon, and night! How long will we fight? Morning, noon, and night! Why are we here? To fight for freedom! How long will we fight? Morning, noon, and night! Why are we here? To fight for justice! How long will we fight? Morning, noon, and night! Stop, stop! Deportation, no more family separation! 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 One more thing. So you guys say, you say no way, no way, no way! constantly keep getting rejected after every kind of plea and eventually it breaks through I mean and I, I'm sure I want to ask a question for you guys on how rejection feels and, and what I mean I think we all have had these struggles so I hope you guys could deeply reflect about this maybe speak about these things too as an audience thank you for having Follow, follow your instincts in your heart. Like if you're not someone who likes to go out to marches, don't go. If you're someone who likes to teach, go teach. Like we all like to do different things, you know. But you have something to contribute. And think about what that is. And sometimes that means pulling away from the herd. It's easy to go follow the crowd or go socialize with all these political activist activities. But there's something, there's something you can do yourself. Search your heart. I'd like to thank all the panelists for coming out tonight. Um, 
We are officially wrapping up, but if you'd like to talk to any panelists, you know, I think if they're not busy, you may be able to uh, spend a few minutes chatting with you and you could exchange contact information. And uh, let's give one last round of applause. And thank you very much. Have a good night.